Please be advised, all music tracks used in this production are sole property of Kelson Communications and are original compositions. Thank you. Hey, it's Skiri Jones, executive producer of Elvis Duran and the Morning Show on Z100. I want to talk to you all about my friend and fellow Brooklyn College alumnus, Silas. Your e-journalist, social work advocate, Silas hosts and produces the award-winning Kelson On The Air social work podcast. My friend and fellow BCR alum is now known nationally and internationally as Silas, your e-journalist, social work advocate. His podcast, it's also listed as one of the top social work podcasts you must follow. The award-winning Kelson On The Air social work podcast. Hello and welcome to all our listeners and viewers. This is Silas, your e-journalism social work advocate, producer and host of the award-winning Kelson On The Air social work podcast, available wherever you get your podcast. Our podcast is rated internationally as one of the 40 best social work podcasts you must follow. This podcast promotes, celebrates, uplifts, and highlights the social work profession. Our aim is to educate the general public about the powerful impact social workers have on the lives of those they serve. The podcast will also amplify the vital contributions professional social workers make in every aspect of our society every day. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Silas, your e-journalism social work advocate host of the award-winning Kelso on the Air Social Work Podcast. And I'm really excited today to introduce my guest for today's segment. She is Professor Mrs. Shante Blaze Hopkins, who is an Emmy Award-winning journalist, producer, educator, author, higher education consultant, and public relations expert with more than a decade of experience. Throughout her career, Professor Blaze Hopkins has worked as a television news anchor, reporter, producer, and produce shows and segments and markets all across the country in addition to producing branded video content, public relations and communications strategies. Professor Blaze Hopkins is also a history maker. I'm really excited to tell our viewers and listeners she is currently serving as the first black woman ever to be elected president of the Society of Professional Journalists, Board of Directors, and she's also the immediate past president of the Greater Los Angeles chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists as of the start of 2023. In that role, she has had an opportunity to build coalitions with Southern California journalism organizations, media unions, and First Amendment advocacy groups in order to lobby the state legislature to pass a bill into law that strengthens press freedoms in California. And she is currently the interim associate dean of the Center for Media and design at Santa Monica College, overseeing a campus of 20 plus career education programs. Shanti is also the former faculty advisor to SMC's student run newspaper, Corsair. Under her leadership as faculty advisor, Corsair newspaper won numerous national awards, including several associated college press pacemaker awards. And she is an equity coach for the communications and media studies department SMC. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to present the song introduced to others, our distinguished guest for today, Professor Shante Blaze Hopkins. Professor Hopkins, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And the pleasure is all mine. So we're going to get right into the conversation we want to have. And as I said in my introduction to you, you're a history maker. and We want to make sure viewers and listeners understand but before we get into that, why don't you tell our viewers and listeners, what was it that made you choose a career in broadcast journalism? You know, so it's really interesting. Um, I often tell my students the entire trajectory so that they don't think I was just born <laughs> knowing what I wanted to do and, and accomplishing some of the things that you read in my bio. Uh, when I was in college, I really had not a clue as to what I wanted to do. And I changed my major six times before <laughs> Uh, before I ended up landing on sociology. And uh, the summer before my senior year in college, I got an internship at ABC News through a nonprofit called the Women's Media Group. And they would place qualified female interns into internships across New York City that were in media organizations. And if the internship didn't pay, then the nonprofit would pay. Um, so, you know, through my time at ABC News, you know, I really just fostered this love journalism, but specifically broadcast journalism. 
And when I went back to my institution for my senior year in college, I, I took a public speaking course. And to be honest with you, I took it to pad my GPA because I thought, oh, this will be an easy course to take. Um, and towards the end of the course, the professor pulled me to the side and he said, hey, listen, you know, um, our institution has a campus-wide oratory competition. And I was like, all right. Good, good for them. And he was like, no, I, I think you should, I think you should enter. I think you could win. And I still was kind of like, yeah, no, I, I'm good. I, I'm not interested. And he was like, well, there's a $2,000 prize. And I said, well, where do I set up? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I entered into the competition uh, and I ended up winning uh, the George William Curtis Prize in Oratory at Columbia University. And so in my head, I was like, okay, maybe there's something to this. Is there a way for me to kind of marry this love I have of sociology and understanding why people do the things they do and, and the external factors that impact how we move throughout the world and public speaking. You know, what, what career marries those two, those two things together? And I landed on broadcast journalism. And so because my undergraduate um, institution, Columbia University, at the time, they didn't have any undergraduate degree in journalism, it didn't exist. Um, and so for me, it was important to go to a graduate school that specialized in journalism so that I could learn not only the history, you know, um, the writing foundations, all of those things, but I also wanted to make sure that I understood how to shoot, how to edit, um, how to direct, how to really do every facet of the industry, because I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was getting into and so that I was you know, um, someone who could be a chameleon if I needed to, and I could be adaptable um, and I could, you know, get a job anywhere in the industry if I needed to. And so I ended up going to the University of Miami uh, that has an amazing journalism program, especially their graduate journalism program. It's very hands on. And so I learned how to do all of those things and, you know, was fortunate enough to be involved with student media there. Uh, I was the news director there for a while and was an executive producer on the morning show. And then did a lot of field anchoring for special, you know, assignments and, and special projects that the institution was doing. So, you know, I really kind of, you know, dove in head first and got a, as much experience as I possibly could. And at the same time, I was working at an internship with the South Florida Sun Sentinel in their TV unit and had the opportunity to write scripts that, you know, aired on the NBC station there in Miami. Um, you know, was able to work on some special assignment pieces with the reporter that worked there. And because of that, was able to put together a pretty decent reel. And so, you know, back in those days, you had to put your reel on a whole bunch of VHSs and put them in, <laughs> in uh, envelopes and mail them across the country. Um, and ended up getting a call from a station in El Paso, Texas, and, you know, was hired on the phone, sight unseen. And so that was kind of the start of my journalism career. But to be honest, I really wanted to be able to, you know, um, give people a platform to tell their stories and specifically for marginalized communities and communities that reflected the communities that I grew up in. So people who looked like me and making sure that their stories could be told. And I wanted to be the one to be able to help tell those stories. And so, so that's how I kind of ended up in the business. Very interesting, very interesting story in the, in the journey that brought you from there to here, um, we're going to dive into that a little bit more. So thank you for sharing that with our viewers and listeners. Um, but I, I wanted to now move on to this history. So, you know, very, very proud to say that you know, I have the very first Black female president of the Society of Professional Journalists on my show. It is an honor. So tell us about the significance of that in your opinion. Yeah, you know, I'm a firm believer in understanding that I probably shouldn't be here, right? I should probably should not be in the rooms that I'm in. I probably shouldn't have, you know, the leadership opportunities that I have earned. I probably shouldn't have a seat at the table, at the tables that I've been at, and been being able to make the decisions that I'm making at such a high level. Um, and, and I say that because I look at my ancestors and everything that they had to do just to fight to be seen as human, you know, let alone being seen as people who are capable of amazing things. And so for me, I make it a point to take on opportunities where I feel like I can be impactful 
And once I get those opportunities, that's always my goal. Because if I am not being impactful, I'm not using this life to be impactful to the communities around me, to be impactful to people who look like me, to be impactful to marginalized communities, well, then I'm doing a disservice to my ancestors' legacy. And that's how I view it every single day. And so, you know, being elected vice president of SPJ, which automatically becomes president after your your one year term, it meant a lot. And I think, you know, it meant a lot to 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 sending a signal to people who look like me that this is possible and you too can do it. And I'll be honest, you know, um, a former SBJ president, Rebecca Aguilar, who was the first Latina president of SBJ, um, we go way back. We worked in the same market in Dallas, Texas, um, many, many years ago, maybe 15 years ago at this point. And so we were competitors uh, at stations and she became president of SBJ you know, decades later. At the time, I was the president of the LA chapter of SPJ. And, you know, she had kind of seen me in meetings and running events and things like that. And so she reached out to me and she was like, hey, I remember you from Dallas. How you doing? And she said, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been watching you for a little bit. And I really think that you could be a future president of SPJ. And to be honest with you, when she said it to me, I was like, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> kind of kind of the same way, like my professor pulling me to the side and telling me that I should enter this oratory competition. It was kind of the same feeling. And she was like, you know, I really think you could make a difference. And I really think that you could be the first Black woman ever to lead this organization. And, you know, I took some time to think about it. Um, you know, my my go-to is always um, to go to what Michelle Obama calls her kitchen table, right? Mm -hmm. So the people that you surround yourself with when, you know, you're having those moments, you're about to make a big, big decision, you're doubting yourself that can give you a gut check that you trust, right? And so the head of my kitchen table has always been my husband. And so, you know, I went to him and I said, hey, what do you think about this? You know, this opportunity is, is you know, potentially something that I could run for and, and take on. And he was like, you know, I think you could be really good at this. You know, if, if, if you think that you can be impactful, because that's always your goal, go for it. And so I said, okay. Let, let's do this. And, you know, I worked very hard to earn people's votes, to earn the members' votes of SPJ by just being transparent about my vision and what I wanted to do and how I thought I could move the organization forward. And that resonated. And I was happy, you know, when, when the election results came out that, you know, this was, this was a message that people felt that could, they, could, they could get behind. And that was, that was a special moment. Okay. Great. Great, great story. So you just mentioned something that really piqued my interest, I'm sure, viewers and listeners. You talked about your vision of what it would be like for you as the leader of the Society of Professional Business. Talk to our audience about your vision. Yeah, you just yeah, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things that I wanted to make sure that we paid attention to was one diversity in newsrooms. And and when we talk about diversity, I'm not just talking about diversity of race. You know, I think sometimes that's a given, but also diversity of age, diversity of area, of region where you come from, diversity of international voices, uh, diversity in terms of voices from the LGBTQ plus community. All of those things within a newsroom, right, makes sure that you are reflecting the communities that you cover. If you have those voices in the newsroom to be able to impact the coverage that you are are trying to to do, it means that you're not going to have gaps in your coverage. And it means that you're going to be covering communities in ways that are positive and move the needle and help, right? Instead of being harmful and negative uh, and, and potentially, you know, um, you know, exacerbating some harms that maybe media organizations or newsrooms have done in the past to these particular communities. So that's one. Um, the other thing is, you know, really looking at the business model of of local news and in how how it can be sustainable going forward, um, because I think we've seen time and time again, especially just in January of 2024, the number of news media organizations that are laying off journalists at a an alarming rate and at an alarming pace. And I think what we're seeing is that the business model that we have. In the journalism, in, in the journalism industry, especially at the local level, um, you know, it, it needs some tinkering. Um, and, and maybe needs an overhaul. Uh, but, you know, looking at how we can make sure that local news is sustainable 
for the communities that we cover is so important because if journalists go away, democracy is not far behind. And, you know, I think it's important that SPJ and other organizations, other journalist organizations uh, like SPJ are really telling that story to the public that, you know, listen, if you don't have journalists, you know, you're not going to be well informed. You're not going to have anyone out there constantly holding the powerful to account, right? You know, there's that saying that democracy dies in darkness. Well, it dies in darkness because you don't have journalists around to tell you what's happening, right? What's happening in your communities with not only, you know, at the federal level, but really at the, at the backyard level, you know, those local city, state, um, you know, elections, that's really where policy is made that impacts you on a day to day basis. So if you don't have journalists covering city council meetings, if you don't have journalists at the state, uh, capital, you know, reporting on, on what's happening up there, well, there is a gap in knowledge. That means that you're less informed when you head to the polls. You're less informed when your rights are being taken away or trampled on. And so, you know, that was also something that was very important. The third thing really was about making sure that we were paying attention to the mental health of journalists in our industry. This is a tough industry to be in. And, you know, despite some of the narratives that we've heard that journalists are this elite bunch of folks that are making money hand over fist, that could be further from the truth. Most journalists are, are living paycheck to paycheck and they are putting themselves in situations where they are constantly you know, uh, being traumatized by the stories that they're covering without a lot of mental health support, mm -hmm. right? So I've seen, you know, a lot of journalists that I am colleagues with, even family members who left the business simply because their mental health could not sustain staying in the business because the resources haven't necessarily been there. And so, you know, part of what I did when I, when I uh, started as president of SPJ is we created a journalist mental health task force. And this month alone, when we saw hundreds of journalists losing their jobs, we pulled them together and we created an entire page of resources from mental health resources to job banks, to training, all of those things. So it could be in one place. So we could be some kind of a resource for those journalists that were being impacted by these layoffs to help them figure out what's next. How do I navigate this? How do I protect my mental health through this? It is a lot to lose your livelihood and not know what's next. And so, you know, for me, those three things were very important to pay attention to and move the needle on. But the biggest thing of all was, you know, I inherited quite the financial challenge at our at our organization. And, you know, I'm proud to say that uh, we just passed our 2024 budget for SPJ and it has a $220,000 surplus. And that was just not the case uh, when I took over as vice president. We were very, very much in the hole. And fortunately, with the support of our foundation, um, you know, we're, we're in a very unique position, more so than other journalism organizations, where we have a foundation that, that was created to be in support of the society, not just from uh, programming and education, but from a financial perspective. So our foundation has $12 million in the bank. And so being able to sit down with their president and negotiate a reinvestment plan that infused a significant amount of money into the society for the next four years was a significant hill to, to kind of cross, but we got there. And so now I think, you know, we've started to set the organization up in a way where it's going to be sustainable for many, many, many years to come. You know, we're the oldest journalism organization in the country. And, you know, it, to me, it wasn't an option to allow it to close. It just wasn't an option. So to me, it was, I need to do whatever I, I can do to leave this organization better off than I found it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that, that I want you to also touch on is, you know, because SBJ has a uh, freelance or division, I should say. Yeah, our freelance community. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think of freelancers and independent media producers, do you think they can have an impact on making sure those stories get told as we see new hopes closing? Absolutely. And I will tell you that our freelance community is probably one of the biggest and in, in, in most thriving uh, groups that we have within SPJ. Um, and, you know, one of the things that they really try to do is provide resources to folks who 
maybe recently or laid off or are are just graduating and trying to figure out how to enter into the industry, you know, showing them how to be freelancers, everything from not just, you know, how do I come up with a story and how do I pitch it to news media outlets, but also on the business side, you know, how do I file my taxes and make sure that, you know, I don't get taken to the cleaners come tax time, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and and I think that as we see more traditional news media organizations shrinking and laying off more folks and losing the resources that they had, it's going to become more and more normal to see freelance journalists out there in communities covering these stories. Mm -hmm. And I think as freelancers, you know, you have a bit more freedom than you might have you than you might have if you're connected to a traditional newsroom, right? You also have the ability to kind of be your own kind of community, uh, you know, community expert. You know, if you really think about it, you can be embedded in those communities. You can go to those communities on a daily basis and build those kind of relationships that help tell you really impactful stories. Right. So I think as we see the shrinking of our industry, the area that you are going to see growth in is freelancers. Um, really by necessity, I, you know, I don't think we're, we're really giving the industry much choice. Um, so, you know, I think that that area of SPJ is so important and so integral to where our industry is going and making sure that, you know, that type of community is supported so that they can then support other journalists, you know, has been in, in extremely important, especially during these times that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you uh, won record as an Emmy Award-winning journalist. And tell our, our audience a little bit about some of your Emmy Award-winning. Yeah, sure. So um, I can tell you, you know, the Emmy that I won was connected to a story that I did when I was in Las Vegas at the CBS station. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the day that I came in, it was a Sunday evening, and we got a call to the station from a mother uh, who was telling us that her daughter had gone to Lebanon uh, with her father, who, you know, at the time it was the woman's ex-husband, uh, to see his family. The father was from Lebanon. And while they were there, a civil war broke out and they got trapped, stuck there. And so she reached out to us to help tell this story so that we could somehow influence the powers that be to get more, you know, evacuation boats there. Um, because she wanted to get her daughter out of there. She wanted her back home, understandably. And so, you know, my photographer and I, we went to her house. We told that story. We stayed in touch with her and we started doing, um, her story almost every single day for about two to three weeks. We ended up getting connected with the daughter and the father over in Lebanon. So there were many nights where my photographer and I, we slept in the newsroom because the time difference, just so that we could get the interviews, put together the stories and have them ready uh, for the next newscast. And because of how we covered the story, um, when it came time for the, the daughter and the father to finally get out of there and fly to Baltimore, um, the mother called us. It was, and I'll never forget this, it was a Saturday morning, probably 7 a.m. Um, and I get the call. And I think I had been out the night before. And so I'm like, hello. And she's like, hey, you know, I'm calling you because I just got word. My daughter is flying in to BWI. Um, if you and your photographer can get to the airport and meet me and get on this flight with me, you're the only TV crew I will allow to be with me to catch us reuniting. And so I'm like, okay, I got to go. I got to go. So I, I call my photographer and I'm like, dude, you got to wake up, meet me at the station. We got to get to the airport. I'm calling my news director. I'm like, hey, I know this is last minute. We need the company credit costs. <laughs> so we were able to book the flights. Um, wow. Thankfully, our station was right near the airport. So, you know, stopped at the station, got all of my photographer's gear. We book it to the airport. We're sprinting through the airport. Thank, thankfully, you know, Las Vegas McCarran Airport is not a big airport. So we get to the gate, I think, 20 minutes before boarding. So we see her and she's just chilling and sitting. She's like, what took you guys so long? And we're like, hey, <laughs> so, you know, we fly to her with her to uh, Baltimore and we were able to 
catch the reunion between her and her daughter. And it was such a special moment. And we interviewed them the very next morning at breakfast. And then we flew back with them. And when we arrived at the airport, we were headed down this escalator and every single news station in town was there to see the homecoming. But we, me and my photographer, were standing right next to the fail sink going down the elevator. We're just like, hey, guys. That's the scoop. I said, we got the scoop. Um, and so, you know, it was such a magical story. And, you know, just feeling like we had even a little part in, you know, moving the needle to get them the the evacuation vessel that they needed to get out of there. You know, it felt really, really good. And so, you know, months later, we submitted that series of stories for an Emmy. And um, the funny thing is, I was on a job interview um, during the Emmy Award ceremony. So I wasn't there. And so when I landed back in Las Vegas, uh, um, my photographer called me and he was like, uh, hey. And I was like, hey, what's going on? And he was like, so I'm standing here holding your Emmy. And I was like, wait, what? I was like, we won? He was like, we won. Um, wow. And so, yeah, so that, you know, it, that was very special because we were both very early on in our careers. And, you know, we just thought it was a story that needed to be told. And and we thought it was a story that we needed to stick with. And I remember having an argument with another uh, reporter in my newsroom who was trying to steal the story. Um, and I was like, over my dead body. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he backed off. Um, but yeah, it was a very, very special story that we were able to tell. Awesome. Awesome. So, so with that and all the things that you've done leading up to um, becoming president, in your opinion, how do you believe your wealth of experience as a broadcast journalism professional in the field helps you to be a more impactful person? I mean, it's everything. You know, being able to tell your students that you didn't just read about it, that you, you lived it. And you're, you know, you do it and you're still in contact with colleagues who are still doing it and you're, you still have the pulse on what's going on in the industry. It's huge, you know, being able to show your students like, look, no, this is me out in the field doing the thing. Um, you know, it gives you a level of legitimacy with your students where they feel like, well, yeah, I can listen to her because she's walked the walk and, mm -hmm. you know, I want to be where she, where she ended up. So, um, you know, absolutely. Let me listen to her. And, you know, I, I really try and, and be as transparent with my students as possible about not just the successes, but also the failures that I had. You know, the 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 misstarts, the, ooh, I'm not going to do that again. Um, You know, I, I try to make sure that they understand that this is a journey and, you know, the journey isn't always pretty and the the trajectory isn't always what you would expect. And, you know, that I think is so important when you're teaching um, young minds and young adults and even even older adults who are just changing careers because mm -hmm. I have a significant number of those. You know, the oldest student I've ever had was 65 years old, you know. And so for me, it's really about how do I show that this is possible, but also show that it's hard work and it's going to take you being dedicated and it's going to take you you know, putting your head down and getting some stuff done and, and really ignoring kind of the noises in your head that tell you you can't do something, you know, that's important. And building, you know, your kitchen table so that you have folks that you can rely on and that you could, that can always give you a gut check that you, that you trust. Absolutely. And so uh, the other thing I want you to touch on, because it, it all kind of plays um, into this big circle, uh, your public relations and social media expertise. Um, tell our audience about that part of your profession. Yeah, sure. You know, I when I left the business um, many, many, many years ago, uh, back in maybe 2012, I think, um, I was approached by a uh, a former intern who was taking classes at a community college, and she recommended me to start, you know, being an adjunct teacher. She appreciated, you know, my teaching style. But during that time, I also went... Um, on a trip with my my now husband um, to a wedding in Puerto Rico and ended up meeting the um, director of marketing for an online travel booking website called Cheap Caribbean. And, you know, we hit it off there, found out she lived in Dallas. So when we got back to Dallas, we went and had lunch. So she's telling me about, you know, some of the things that 
the PR firm that they had hired had been doing and things that they weren't doing. And and so she was telling me about how they had this partnership with Make-A-Wish Foundation. And she was like, yeah, you know, we're, we're excited about granting, you know, these all-inclusive trips to these families of these Make-A-Wish kids. And I'm like, oh, so I'm sure your PR firm has been pitching that story to, you know, every news media outlet in town. She was like, no, why should they? And I was like, oh my God, that's low-hanging fruit. Are you kidding me? And so I just started, you know, throwing out these ideas and whatever. And she said, you know, can you do me a favor? Can you maybe put together a presentation for my chief marketing officer and come to the office and present some of the things you think we could be doing from a PR standpoint, you know, to really get some traditional media coverage and all these things, whatever. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. So I go in, you know, I, I put together this this kind of, you know, plan that had to do with not only earned media, but also some branded content. Um, and at the time, not a lot of people were doing branded content. This was back in 2012. Um, and so, you know, things like Twitter were just kind of starting to take off, um, but it really wasn't that big yet. You know, so pitching things like, you know, sponsored uh, posts by celebrities and, and influencer wasn't really a thing yet either. Um, so I presented the whole thing, and and when I was done, the chief marketing officer was like, "Well, this looks great. How much is this going to cost us?" And I was like, "Huh? What do you mean?" Um, and so I was like, "Oh, you know, let me go back home and crunch some numbers. I want to be a- accurate and whatever." You know. Meanwhile, in my head, I'm I'm sweating bullets because I don't know what I've just gotten myself into. Um, so I leave the meeting. I go straight to a friend's house who had just left one of the biggest PR firms in the country, and. Uh, she was a former news anchor as well. And so I knock on her door and she's like, what, what's, what's going on? What's up? And I said, I think somehow I just got a client and I have no idea what I'm doing. And so, you know, can you help me with this? And she's like, yeah, sure. So, you know, we ended up starting this company called Get Media PR. And, you know, Cheap Caribbean was our first client. And then somehow the word got out and we ended up with five or six clients, completely word of mouth. Um, and so with Cheap Caribbean, you know, we, we put together this, this plan for this social media campaign where, and, and this will tell you how long ago this was, um, where we used members of the Kardashian family um, for a 48 hour social media campaign on Twitter. And the price was like $5,000, something like that. So if that tells you anything, we were using members of the Kardashian family to push out the message of this particular company all for $5,000. Um, and so, you know, so, you know, I, in many ways, we were, we were kind of ahead of our time in some of the ideas that we were pushing forward and some of the things that we did. You know, we also created a series of, um, episodic videos where we went to off the beaten path locations in the Caribbean, um, on different Caribbean islands to show all of the amazing things that you could do if you booked a trip to these places. Um, you know, and so I ended up flying, you know, all over the Caribbean to do these wow. things. Um, and so, you know, those are just ideas that we thought were cool and would make sense and, you know, maybe it would the needle and, you know, we just found a lot of success with it. And, um, and so, yeah, we run that, we ran that company for a couple of years. We had a lot of good success. Wow. So, yeah. Awesome. And you mentioned the uh, term, it's, it's short the industry term, and maybe some of our audience might be wondering. What's the concept behind you said branded content? Yeah. So branded content. So if you think about Coca-Cola, for instance, right? If they're creating videos to kind of showcase the culture that they want to be connected to or the kind of, you know, lifestyle that, you know, can be aspirational if you use their product, right? It's that idea that you are creating content that feels more like entertainment and less like a commercial. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we thought that that was an interesting way to tell a company's story because we were you know, in broadcast news. And so mm-hmm. all we knew was telling stories. So to us, we knew the impact of being able to tell a good story to your audience. And so we just kind of took that concept and applied it to the companies that we were working with. It just seemed to make sense to us. And, you know, now you see branded content everywhere. You know, um, most Fortune 500 companies have an entire, you know, unit that does nothing but create branded content. Um, you know, so I, I feel like, you know, we were on the cutting edge of kind of, you know, figuring out that that's something that could potentially move the needle with audiences, 
you know, and, you know, we had a chance to work with a company that was very open to us taking risks and trying things. And, you know, um, and, and I was able to do some of those branded content videos with the owner of CheapCaribbean.com, who was a former sports broadcaster. And so because we had that connection, he was open and he was like, no, this makes sense. I get it. Um, you know, so it helped that we were connected with a company that, you know, was small enough to let us kind of do whatever and, and take calculated risks, um, but was big enough where they had the budget to be able to support these, you know, these really wild ideas that we had. It was kind of a cool time. Awesome. And with all of your, your amazing accomplishments, you know, quite a few, the concept that you mentioned earlier felt some, some sort of obligation to, to set a standard for those who may be in the room that look like you but never know, thought that somebody like yourself or themselves could rise to such a position. So in, in all of your experience and being in the position that you are in now, for Black student journalists, how do you go about, you know, lighting that fire or, you know, you can do this too? The the first question I often ask is, why not you? Why not you? Right. You know, we I, I try to get them out of this thought that success has to look like a certain person. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, you know, opportunities only come to someone who looks like this, mm -hmm. you know, getting that thought completely out of their heads, you know, getting them to stop the deficit thinking and saying, why can't it be you? You know, you've put in the work, you know, you've done what you need to do to understand your craft and to be able to execute it at a high level. So why couldn't it be you? And I think that is maybe the biggest tool to give to young broadcast journalists, whether they are black journalists, whether they are journalists from another marginalized community, is to start getting them to ask that question of themselves. Why not me? Why couldn't it be me? And I think once you kind of put that seed in their head, then their world opens up and they see themselves doing things that maybe they didn't see themselves doing before because they've never seen someone do it, right? You know, instilling in them that it's okay to be the first. It's okay. The good thing that means is that there's no blueprint. You get to make the blueprint. You get to chart your own path. And in many ways, it's scary, but it's also very freeing. Because, you know, you're, you're not filling these big shoes. There's no shoes to fill. They, the shoes don't exist. You know, they're your shoes. Um, and so, you know, just really getting students to understand that as long as you've put in the work and you've prepared yourself, why can't it be you? And um, before we get to, to, to the end of this, I wanted you to kind of touch on the whole concept. The student journalists the importance of them joining the Society of Professional Journalists while they're still students. Yeah, you know, the, the great thing about SPJ is for many students when they're in college, it is their first kind of introduction into the industry, right? You know, they're able to connect with professional journalists. They're, they're able to start the process of networking they're able to kind of build these relationships that, to be honest with you, will help them get their first job, their second job, their fifth job, um, and understanding how small this industry is. You know, that to me is some of the biggest upsides of joining SPJ as a student. In addition to that, the fact that there is so much programming that student chapters do and it's not just programming that the student chapter advisor is coming up with on their own and saying, please come, but there's opportunities to be leaders within these student chapters. So you're not just learning about the craft of journalism and learning how to network and getting skills that are going to get you your next job. You're also learning how to lead a team. You're learning how to manage your peers. You're learning how to, you know, plan and execute events. You're learning how to fundraise. You're learning how to do marketing and PR. Um, and so, you know, to me, you are learning skills that are going to help you regardless of what industry you decide to go in, whether it's journalism, a tangential industry or something completely different. So those skills, those soft skills that you're getting as being a part of a student chapter, 
uh, as a student journalist with SBJ, they're invaluable. They're invaluable. And that brand alone and that name alone on your resume can open a lot of doors. You know, if people see SPJ and you were leadership within an SPJ student chapter, well, that says something, you know, and and I think um, the opportunities can start to expand. So as we get ready to wrap things up, it's been a really great, enlightening conversation. Enjoy all of your stories. What, what I always like to do at the end of each of my podcast episodes, I like to ask my guests to think of something they'd like to leave with listeners so that, you know, when they're listening to this and they, they hear it again for the second or third time, or maybe even the first time, what would you like to leave listeners with? Something inspiring, motivating, and uplifting. I think one of the things that I would say um, is to really understand the importance of journalism and journalists to our very democracy and, and to the lives that we sometimes take for granted and all of the luxuries that we have, even when it doesn't feel like that. Freedom is a luxury. Freedom is a luxury, right, that, that many nations across the globe are not afforded. And part of the freedom that we enjoy in this country is because we have a free press, is because it is considered the fourth estate of our government. And so it is so important that we fight tooth and nail to maintain that. And so I would say that what I would leave listeners with is that you need to support local news. You need to support journalists. They are a part of your community. They are doing this work because they love the communities that they're in, and they are there in service of those communities. Journalism is a public service, and it deserves to live. It needs to live, but it needs the support of the public in order to do so. So please support journalism. Support your local newspaper. Support your local TV station. It's important. It's important to the lives that we've created here in this country. Yes, awesome point, awesome way to end it. And uh, to all our listeners and viewers and our audience, um, it's been my distinct pleasure we've been talking with uh, Professor Shante Blades Hopkins, a uh, history maker, and she is the, currently serving as the first black woman uh, to be ever elected president of the Society of Professional Journalists. Um, kudos to her for that. She's also an interim associate dean of the Center for Media Design at Santa Monica College. It's been a really great pleasure. You've been listening to the Kelso and the Social Work Podcast. It's Black History Month special. Uh, it's more than a month, but we're going to get this story out there so we can make sure people understand, you know, what's important to the whole concept of Black African diaspora. So, Dr. Blaze Hopkins, I want to say I called you doctor. I don't know if you have a doctor yet. I got a funny story. It's coming. It's Every person that I've interacted with in my professional colleague career, I've called them doctor and shortly after that they got me a doctor. So you're on your way. So I didn't know that. I received that. I received that. <laughs> so, uh, and on that note, I want to thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the Health the Air Social Work Podcast. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been great. Once again, this is Silas, your e-journalism social work advocate, producer, and host of the show. You've been listening to the award-winning Kelson on the Air social work podcast. This and all other episodes are available on our Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeart audio podcast platforms, among others. The podcast is also available on our Spotify and YouTube video podcast platforms. Go to any search engine and type in Kelson on the Air in the search window to hear this show in its entirety. Please make sure to click subscribe to support our podcast. And don't forget to like, comment, download, and share. To reach us for more information, email us at info at kelson.org. That's info at kelson.org. Or to suggest future topics, log into www.kelson.org. That's www.kelson.org and fill out the share a topic form on our homepage. Thank you for tuning in. This has been a Kelson Communications production.